what well-intentioned mistakes or areas of focus do you wish autistic advocates would stop doing or do differently? There's a lot of autistic advocates in the book club. So mm -hmm. what do you think? What do you think? What do you see? The first thing that comes to mind is this. <laughs> and I might make some people mad. That's not my intention. I just, I just come real. We're good with that. Okay. <laughs> Be careful about the way you word things to these parents. I'm not talking about some people need, you know, a little tough love. That's not what I'm talking about. This is what I'm saying. Whether you are autistic or non-autistic, you do, you know, so if you're not, so I'm sorry, let me back up. Autistic people, whether they are parents or not, do have a level of understanding or similarity to the, an autistic child that the non-autistic parent does not have. That is the truth. However, if you are not a parent, if you have not been in, involved in raising a child or, you know, in some capacity, whether it's a stepchild, whether it's a whatever, then there are some things that you don't know. It doesn't mean that your advice is not valid. It doesn't mean that you suck, that you don't, that you're not, you know, you don't have a great deal of, of information, a wealth of information about um, child development and children and autistic children in particular. But I think that we, we need to be careful not to, uh, the whole purpose of sharing, because this isn't easy, the advocacy, the activism that we do, it's draining. You know, it's, it, 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 you know, depletes a lot of spoons to dig into your personal experiences, some of which are painful, and, you know, share things with people or relive certain situations and, or, you know, it's, you know, and, and get things to a point where, you know, you're trying to be able to understand something that's not, you know, natural to them. You're doing this for a purpose. You want it to be effective. I'm not telling you to, you know, compromise yourself, but I think that when, yes, thank you. I love that strategic advocacy. When you go in there and you're you have no kids and you're telling somebody who raised children that um, they don't know this and the other, and you know this, you sound stupid. I mean, sorry, I'm not trying to be ableist, but I'm just saying that there were things that I didn't understand and before I became a parent. And I'm just talking about parenting, period. It's not about autism in general. There's certain things that you don't know till you've done it. There's certain things that are just kind of hard. They're not um, transferable experiences. Um, it's and like so we I all think come from our own perspectives and just to recognize that we all that we are all limited by those perspectives all of us the parents yeah. yeah yes and our and we are too so it's like so you know when the parent says i know my child i'm their voice and you're saying no i know i've got the same neurology as your child i've been a five-year-old autistic child i know this you're both kind of right because you aren't in their house they know that when the child does this it means they're hungry or when they do their eye like this you know or whatever their head like you know they know certain nuances of get from the lived experience of living with that child. Do they understand it? Maybe they don't understand a freaking thing about it. Not one thing. That's where you come in. But they do know things you don't know because you're not there in their house. You do know a lot. And so I know that it may sound obvious, but I think that in our passion to get through to people, we don't realize what, you know, the way people perceive, because people don't understand the way we communicate, you know, so people talk about how hard we are, weird we are about communication. But I think that non-autistic people are a lot harder to communicate with and to make ourselves understood because they perceive things a particular way even if that's not how we intend it. So I just hope that parents say, you know, don't, you know, because we aren't all going to have kids, you know, autistic people, you know, activism, it, you know, you may have children, you may be child-free, you may be younger, older, whatever, um, you know, so you shouldn't be limited that you can't give advice about children, you know, about parenting if you're not a parent, but you need to be cognizant of the way you're wording the advice and the type of advice that you're giving, because there are some things that as a, you know, parent, you don't, you haven't experienced yet. You know, thank you. Privilege is good to remember. Absolutely. I, especially in social justice service, I have the time and energy and research to learn. I don't have three jobs and five kids. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that is important to you. Like a lot of, a lot of our, uh, well, a lot of everybody does not have the time. Well, they're not on Facebook. They're not on Twitter all day, every day to know all of the things and all of the nuances. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, yeah. that's important. I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. Um, another thing, and I, and I know, uh, and this is my opinion, um, is, you know, so I know everyone feels differently about this. So some people, you know, so I feel that, yes, this is our neurology. It's, it's natural. It's, you know, the way we were born, 
you know, et cetera, et cetera, we should be accepted. But I think that again, you know, if we look at the social model of disability and society and ableism, I think it, it is a, a condition that's disabling, you know, so there's strengths to it. There's, you know, and there's challenges to it. Just like me being a black woman, I wouldn't be a, anybody else, but I'm not going to sit here and say it's always a great thing. Sometimes it's a challenging thing because of the circumstances that life puts me in. Doesn't yeah. matter you know, and so, or being a woman, you know, same thing, you know, so you can, you can accept and love yourself and still recognize that, you know, there's, you know, that life is, you know, not a crystal stair. And so I think that sometimes when people, you know, like, I feel like there's, you know, and I know we have a communication disability, but sometimes some of the things that we say unintentionally, I feel are ableist. I feel like we, some of, some autistic activists um, unintentionally throw other disabled people under the bus when we say something like, you know, yeah, we're autistic, but there's nothing wrong with our brain or we're not all intellectually disabled. Well, what about those of us, well, those people who are, you know, I have a child that's not autistic who's aut who is intellectually disabled. So or should my child, my autism is great, but intellectual disability is horrible. Like you hate that, eradicate right. that, you know, or, you know, or, or speak, you know, or when people are, I, another thing that I also don't like that, you know, we do sometimes, and I don't think it's a lot of us, is that, you know, when people are talking about, you know, like there's been people making different discussions about functioning labels, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and to try to find a common ground, um, they'll acknowledge that they're, you know, here or they're wherever that someone is ex assuming that they are. And I, I don't like that mentality at all. I, aside from the fact that functioning labels are completely inaccurate, um, I don't like, um, we don't need to concede any kind of a point to anyone for anything. I'm not, I, I refuse any anyone who has the a mentality of all non-speaking people are, are low functioning, all speaking people are high functioning, please spend a day in my house. <laughs> like, no, I will not, you know, and so I don't like that if, you know, rather than us trying to, you know, have these little conversations and, and compromises with parents, why don't we amplify the voices of our siblings who are non-speaking so that, because they have plenty to say of their own, you know what I mean, about what, how they view themselves, their needs, their advocacy, um, they're everywhere. And, you know, and I think that, you know, it's our responsibility. There, there used to be a, um, a person who was on the AWN board who used to say that if, a, you know, as an autistic person, if they, um, you know, if people came to them for a quote like the media or to speak on a panel, they would not participate if there was um, not a person of color there as well, because on so many of these panels and, um, you know, keynote addresses or what have you were not very diverse. And so I, I similarly, I've started doing something like if I'm doing a group project, if there's no non-speaking autistic people um, who are involved in some capacity of leadership, you know, either planning or speaking, then I won't appear. It's um, so important. I, yeah. It's so important just to make that known, like, no, uh-uh. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, and I get that sometimes it, it is harder to, mm -hmm. to, to get those people to, to come and join you, but it's, it's worth the effort to get them what they might need extra access, um, yeah. accommodations. And yeah, you Just need to do that. It. You need to work yeah. on that. I mean, if you're, if you're able to plan an event, uh, whether it's in-person or virtual, then you're planning stuff ahead of the game. Anyway, you're planning your tech people, you're planning your meals, you're planning your budget, you're planning this. You're not doing it though before. So whatever you're doing, however much in advance, incorporate this as well. If it's important, you'll do it. If, you know, if it's pre-recorded, then the person shares, you know, it, you know, you know, that if that's, works better or if there's a support person, you know, I think that because these, these things help all of us, mm -hmm. there is not a single, well, I, I, I won't say there's not a single, I bet there are very few autistic people who are not non-speaking some of the time, <laughs> you know what I mean? If not, a, you know, if not a, a good portion of the time, I know that like, this is the most I've spoken today, like to y'all and I probably won't speak to the rest of the I day. Know, I like, know. Yeah, you know, we text each other, you know, there's like, you know, so it's like, you know, there are meetings and things that I have for work where I'm, you know, you know, typing all of, and this is before COVID where I'm using the chat feature or I'm emailing my thoughts or ideas. I just, so, you know, with the universal design is something that, you know, benefits the most you users, period. Um, and so we are one community. Um, and so I just feel, I feel like that's something that we could do better. And I think I, it's not that people are doing a poor job of it. I just think we can always grow. 
And there was a question that came through, but I can't, I didn't get it. Um, Jules yeah. asked, um, do you think that cultural considerations need to be taken into account when determining what is ableism and what isn't? For example, sometimes I feel like white people make all of the decisions about defining ableism and they use it to perpetuate racism. What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, yes, yes, yes. I agree. I think that, and I think in doing so, we are, um, you know, we're harming one another. Um, I think there was, um, so I think about certain communities. Um, certain communities are, are not, are in different places. So I have a different, and not just with ableism, with other isms too. I, I, there, I had a friend, um, Sandy Kinnaman, who passed away some years ago, who was a, you know, a, a mother of autistic children and also a, a neurodivergent activist. And so, Sandy used to talk about giving people grace and space you know, um, because they, you know, everyone is growing and learning. And so like when I'm in certain, in certain settings or certain places, I give people grace and space because I know they don't get it yet, you know? And if I develop that relationship and if I plant those seeds and I work with them, then they'll get it. If I'm just hammering them over the head, you know, then they're not gonna, they're not gonna hear my message at all to even get to the point of what I want. So like sometimes people, this is an example that I've had with, I've talked about with someone. There, um, there are there are a few prominent um, organizations um, for autism, you know, in in the African American community here in the U.S. Um, if I was to mention their names, if you you know they pop up at the top of the list of Google, you know, if one was to Google. And so there are certain um, certain people in the community who haven't wanted to work with these organizations because they feel like, oh well, I don't like that they are they support this or they think this or they do this. I'm thinking, so what do you think that these black parents are getting when they walk into a, a a, a clinic or whatever, and they're getting their child, child's autism diagnosis. You think they're giving them like the black um, folder, the black list? No, they're giving them the same thing they're giving these white parents, the 100 day kit, this any other. We're already stigmatized in general. And then you're okay, layering the diagnosis in the first place. Let's yes. back that up. Okay. Yes, exactly. So you you so if you if anything, you think that, you know, there if anyone's going to jump in and, you know, and, you know, dive hard into some of these um, interventions that, you know, might be problematic. It's a, it's a parent because we're even more desperate to make sure that our child isn't going to get further left behind or harmed in a society where just their skin color alone is, you know, it, it, you know, is unfortunately an affliction. So um, yes, I think cultural, um, community, you know, cultural considerations need to be taken into account in the way that the timing, the way that we do things, the way, um, and, and, you know, and who is doing it. You know, like if I'm, you know, the, sometimes you will get people to evolve and change if they understand where you're coming from. If you hear them out and you don't, um, you know, just, you know, don't presume. That they, yeah, don't presume that they should know. That all you shouldn't use this word that. or this word or shouldn't do this. You can. So what I'll do often, is, and when people are doing something like that, like for example, if if I'm somewhere and a parent says something about their son is nonverbal, I was like, oh okay. Um, how old is your non-speaking son? You know, or whatever. And because <laughs> unless the the child has said they want to be called nonverbal, you're just saying because that's whatever. If someone says something about high functioning or whatever, whatever, I'll say, okay, so oh, okay, so your niece has minimal needs, you know, or whatever. Um, so I will repeat it back to them so they can hear it the right way. I'm not going to use the stigmatizing terminology, but I'm not going to say, oh, that's so ableist. You said this, you said this, you said this, because frankly, you can't get through an, a research article without all, I mean, every paragraph is full of ableist stuff. You're afflicted with autism, you're suffering, you're this, this disorder. And, you know, it's like the same thing that I do, like with stigmatizing language to be called out, but do it in a way to where you're, you're achieving your goal um, and not, you know, to me, that's important. And I know everybody's not a bridge builder. You know, I know we, we've got all type, all types of people with different approaches. And you they, know. Are, they are they are all valuable. All of those approaches are valuable. It's exactly. Valuable. It's like I tell people we've got, you know, you've got Magneto, you've got Professor X, and you've got other ways, you know, other ways, you know, although as I'm older now, I see some problems in that stuff too, which makes me sad because I used to love those, you know. But anyway, nothing's perfect. But... <laughs> You know, you've got, or if you think about, you know, is Ravenclaw better than Hufflepuff, better than Gryffindor, better than Slytherin? They all have different strengths and weaknesses. And so we, we, we can't use a one approach fits all um, method for parents 
just like there shouldn't be a one gold standard, you know, treatment, intervention, whatever for us. 